The following presentation is brought to you by the Realm Network. Today on Mr. Media, I'll talk to writer John Coates, author of a new comic book artist biography, Don Heck, A Work of Art. Stick around, and welcome to the first day of my campaign to bring back the original Captain Marvel, or as I like to call him, Captain Marvel. So much media, so little time. Who keeps track of it all? That would be me. This is Bob Andelman, and this is a Mr. Media Interview, brought to you by Amazon.com, Audible.com, and 1-800-DIAL-DJs. Please stop by the website, MrMedia.com, click on our advertisers, support the show. And remember, there's more than a thousand interviews available at MrMedia.com. We've been doing this since February 2007. Hope you'll find something you like. And thanks for listening. Mr. Media is recorded live before a studio audience full of comic book fans who will disagree with every word I say, just on general principle, in the new new media capital of the world, St. Petersburg, Florida. In the history of comic book art, Don Heck was one of the most ordinary artists there ever was. Now, that's not me being disrespectful, just honest, as far as I'm concerned. He was a craftsman, but in an era where his counterparts were Jack Kirby, Steve Ditko, uh, John Romita, and Storanko, just to name a few, Don Heck was pretty average. And for a guy present at the superheated epicenter that was the founding of the Marvel Comics universe in the 1960s, one gets the distinct sense from John Coates' new biography, Don Heck, A Work of Art, that the late Mr. Heck would have been just as happy, maybe even happier, drawing commercial illustrations rather than superheroes. I think it's a credit to Coates, in fact, that we get so much evidence uh, through actual Heck interviews during, the, during his career that could sum up the artist's opinion of being present at creation the way my grandmother often reacted to a variety of issues. Feh. That's pretty much the way she would do it. Um, now, not brand feh, you say? Now, there is a certain measure of enthusiasm and color missing from Heck's multiple career-spanning interviews that Coates reproduces here. It becomes all the more apparent when compared against commentary from his industry counterparts who held Heck in far higher regard than he held the industry itself. Drawing the earliest comic books featuring such Marvel icons as Iron Man, the X-Men, the Avengers, and my personal favorite, the original green and white Captain Marvel, well, that was a job for him, nothing more. Now, that said, John Coates has done an admirable job of matching together Heck's life in words and pictures and adding another crucial piece, a puzzle piece, to the all-important history of Marvel Comics. Now, that having been said, the man's still here. John Coates, welcome to Mr. Media. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate that. And i got to ask you, I, I mean, I figure, um, you know, having written a book with the title, Don Heck, A Work of Art, that after hearing that introduction, you're either mad as hell about my description of Mr. Heck, or you might agree just a little bit. Uh, neither. How about that? No. I, you know, it's funny because um, I've got a lot of response to the book, most of it positive. Um, you know, one of the goals I say in the forward was, uh, an introduction rather, is that I wanted to do a couple of things. One, I wanted to show people the guy could really draw, and I think he could. Um, secondly, I wanted to show that he was extremely well respected by his peers. Um, you know, when you have twice Stan Lee sought, uh, seeking him out, once for taking him into Atlas, and then, of course, once the implosion was done, bringing him back, uh, he was ghosting for the Phantom, Lee Fox Phantom newspaper strip. And, of course, you're probably familiar with this. At the time, in the 60s, newspaper strips were still number one, right? They were larger in papers, had more uh, distribution, etc. John Buscema, who's one of my personal favorites, actually hired Don uh, to specifically lead his new school um, as far as an art teacher. And then, of course, he Don later in his life, aside from his comic work, also ghosted on Terry and the Pirates, another newspaper strip. So one of the points I wanted to make with the book was that, you know, it, he he's very stylized in his art, but I, I don't think you can say he's a he's not talented. Um, 
I definitely respect someone who says they don't like his style, but given what I've just said and the, the breadth of his career and how Kirby and all these individuals truly admire this guy's work, I just don't know how you can say he's a bad artist, if that makes any sense. No, I just want to point out, I never said he was a bad artist. <laughs> no, no, you didn't, you didn't, no. you didn't. I, I think, I mean, the thing that struck me is, I think what was happening in the 60s, and I grew up then, I mean, my first comic was like, I don't know, X-Men 5 or 6 or 7, which my grandfather bought at the, the Port Authority bus terminal in New York. So, I mean, I go back, I bought these things off the stands from, from the time I was a little kid. But it seemed to me that he was a very serviceable artist. He could turn out pages. You know, he wasn't the fastest. He was no, no Kirby doing five pages a day. But that's not really the issue in terms of the quality. To me, it was a period of time where the 40s and the 50s, most artists, the let's say 80% of artists were fairly interchangeable in comic books. They all kind of looked like each other deliberately. Uh, they just, it all kind of looked like, you know, and then there were guys like Eisner and Wally Wood and other people who were very distinctive. Uh, Lou, uh, oh God, I can't remember Lou's last name. Fine. Lou Fine. Fine. Yeah, these guys were these guys were were, were distinctive. When the '60s came around, um, it seems to me that not only did did Marvel dominate the era, but it by the end of the '60s, um, the people in comics really were into the comics. I mean, even the people who had come up in the industry in the '50s and '60s. For them to to really be a part of it and to go forward, it seemed to me that they had to embrace it and become part of it. In reading the interviews and looking at his work, I just get the sense that Don it was a day job for Don. It wasn't it wasn't a passion. There's no pa- I don't find passion in his work. I, I find, no. you know, it's it's workable. It's average, but I, I, it's not, you know. Yeah. No, I, I get what you're saying. I would say this. I think Don was from, and of course, I unfortunately never had the opportunity. To, well, I did have an opportunity to speak with him, which I'll share with you in a second, years ago and related to the book. Um, I think that Don came from an era where when you speak to, you know, the Carmen Infantinos, and I had an opportunity to uh, interview Kurt Schaffenberger for Comic Book Marketplace years ago, and Herb Novick, George Tuska, these guys, they came from an era when truly their goal was to get into comics, to get into a newspaper strip. And I th- what's, what's ironic about Don's work is that I think, A, some of his best work was done later in his career and when he was inking his own work. And secondly, I think the way comics are today, where they're more acceptable to artists that aren't the classic superhero style, I think Don's art would be much more valued today if he were still drawing and you know as a contemporary. Um, but I think that Don came from an era where a lot of these guys truly just looked at it as a job. Now, I can tell you in talking with everyone about Don, he absolutely loved to draw. He's one of those guys that when he was literally started drawing, his parents were very supportive of it. He couldn't stop drawing. But to your point, I don't know that he was um, a fanboy of comics per se. I know he loved comic strips. Um, he probably did look at it as a job from a, from a script standpoint. But in talking with everyone who knew him, he never looked at the actual job as anything other than something he had passion for. And I don't know again, if that comes across in the artwork, but he loved to draw. And that's one of the things that came across in the interview in speaking with his peers and, of course, in his own words. Yeah, I mean, it was interesting in that um, it seemed like from everything I've read uh, from the 60s and 70s about Marvel, whether it's the, the origins of Marvel Comics, Stan Lee's book or other people's books, all that, you know, there's been so much. And some of it's very interesting. Uh, and even the interviews in your book with other artists talking about Don and talking about the era, there's a passion there from them, whether it's, you know, um, you know, Kirby was able to take charge of his of his books. Stan would give him an outline and then Kirby would just cut loose. He, you know, he, he drew a lot. He would he would he would write. He would draw Steranko, you know, same kind of thing. Romita, I think. Um, but. Don seemed to push back against that system. He didn't. He just wanted to draw. He didn't want to. He really didn't want to have to worry about, um, uh, you know, figuring out where the story started and ended. He didn't seem interested in that. He didn't seem passionate in the interviews about the characters or care one way or the other what happened to the characters. And it seemed to me, you know, starting with Roy Thomas was probably the the, the vanguard of that. Uh, there was this changing of the guard in the late 60s and into the 70s where you went from guys like Don who were doing it because it was a job and that's why I mentioned commercial illustration I could easily have seen him 
becoming a, a master in, in, in a madman type of uh, uh, ad agency. You know, his style was wonderful for the time, and he drew people very well. But the 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 kind of uh, oh, I hate to use the term, but je ne sais quoi that was Marvel Comics in the '60s and early '70s, it just it just didn't seem to fit him very mm-hmm. well. That's all. Yeah, he he. Uh, um, and again, I'm talking about from reading the interviews as you did, and also speaking with people who knew him uh, firsthand. You know, he was someone who, again, he absolutely loved to draw. I don't think he was ever into the hyperbole, into you know what you're saying made Marvel the the Stan Lee. He joked about it that you know he came into the office twice, two, three times a month. Um, you know, I think uh, Flo Steinberg talks about how she loved seeing him. He was great, but he came in, as you said, like an ad agency. Here's my work. Give him, you know, give me another script type of thing. Um, but I do think that, you know, later in his career, uh, a, I think he was passionate the entire time. But I think later in his career, he really had a difficult time, it seemed, with the inkers. And, you know, some of the inkers may have been subpar, but some of them were very good. And a lot of the inkers he alludes to in the book or in his interviews, I think, did a phenomenal job. Um, there's one point in the book, um, and I've actually conversed with, with Roy Thomas about it, who, by the way, special thanks to Roy Thomas and Michael Yuri for getting me in touch with the folks who I can speak to, the Ramitas and some of the names you've talked about, because without those two, I never would have had access to those folks to, to really flesh out the book. So thanks for that. But back to point, one of the things that is a snippet in the, in the, uh, in the book is where Don comments is from a older interview. I went to see Roy and, Roy was going to give me some, you know, new inker. Well, I think it may have been Daredevil. I don't know. But the inker that was on him was a very good inker. <laughs> I thought it looked pretty good. So I think it was more of he just became very frustrated with the fact that it was a very dynamic style, a very Kirby type world. Uh, all the guys at that time, whether it's Duranko, whether it's, uh, you know, Rich Buckler, who came a little bit later, Barry Windsor Smith, all the original stuff was Kirby. And it was no secret that Kirby, of course, is who he is. And Stan was asking everyone to draw like Kirby. And when you look at Don Heck's work, it just doesn't fit. That's a square peg in a round hole. Yeah. And I think that it really is. And I think that's when you speak to everybody, one of the common threads is he he was like, I just want to draw. Let me do the story. Let me do what I love to do and I'm passionate about. But, you know, just like in the in the 90s when the image uh, type of style came into play, you know, the world's going to change. That's why I said it was somewhat ironic that, Whereas in the late 80s, you know, he didn't have any work and, of course, passed away in the, in the mid-90s. If he would have been around today in a contemporary drawing, his art style, which is extremely stylistic, would be, I think, applauded today. Because if you look at independent comics, whether it's Star Horse or these other ones, I call them independent, non-DC Marvel, that type of work is what people want now. You know, they, I, I love the Ramitas and the Cardis and the Kurt Swans and the Buscemas, but it doesn't seem like that's what a lot of the market wants. So I just, again, find it very ironic that Don would be loved, I think, more at the time he's drawing than he was at the time he was. I laughed when you said the square peg in a round hole because last night as I was drifting off to sleep thinking about, okay, what am I going to say about Don Heck tomorrow? I was thinking <laughs> square peg, round hole, and then I decided, no, no, come up with another way to explain it. And, and that's, you know, where, where I went with that. So I, it made me laugh that you said that. Um, by the way, hi, Roy Thomas. Um, <laughs> um you mentioned uh, that you you had briefly uh, met or spoken to Don. When was that, and how did that come about? Yeah, uh, I'll try to keep it uh, keep it short. But I years ago I started uh, what's called the people have an art board where you take a big art board, you get different artists to draw a five or six inch character on it. And I started it in the early '80s, and I was really fortunate. A lot of people have passed away, but you know, I, uh, the people who drew like a Hawkman as Murphy Anderson, a Flash, Carmen Infantino, that kind of thing. Back at the time when these guys would be at cons and could draw, they were able to do it. And of course, Don Heck didn't go to, I wrote through him through comics interview or one of those magazines. And he, he called me up and he had kind of a Bowery boy type of, you know, talk. It was really funny. And uh, he just started talking, you know, and I was like, Oh, Mr. Heck, thank you. Oh, I'll mail it to you and you return posting on. And of course he did an absolutely just knock down, drag out, beautiful, fit for print Iron Man for me yeah. um, on this board. But he just was the nicest guy. And I never forget, I think I wrote this in, in an interview or something I wrote about him early years ago. When he was writing, when he was talking to me, he kept talking about his disappointment with being on Wonder Woman because he thought that was part of some of his favorite work. And he asked me, do you read Wonder Woman? You know, and I'm like, no, I don't, I'm not like this. You know, I don't read Wonder Woman. 
And, uh, and I did after talking with him and I love the artwork. I just wasn't that cool about the character, but the net of it is he absolutely thought that was his best work. And he said, the book stinks. Nobody buys it. <laughs> it doesn't sell. And, and he talked about how, man, when I got on this book, I'm like, I've hit the big time. I'm on Wonder Woman, you know, Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman. He never knew that the character has really never been a big seller. Maybe right. when Perez took it over and did what he did, but it's never been the hottest book. But of course, by Marquis, you know, maybe that shows you just how unattached he was to some of the comic industry. Well, yeah, I mean, that's I, I won't go back to that. But, yeah, that's something that struck me in the, in the book. But and actually, I have to say that was one of the things that I found interesting about the book. I mean, there's a lot to be that was interesting, but it was interesting to me that there was that continuing thread throughout his story of him not being that interested in the industry itself. He didn't. He didn't play the, the game of, with the fans, and he didn't do the fanzines, and he didn't, and that was fine. I thought that was that made it interesting. It's not like, um, you know, we talked earlier. You did Nick Cardi's book, and Nick seemed to really uh, mm -hmm. regale in, in all that kind of stuff, and Murphy Anderson you know, did it later in his life. Yeah, you make you make a really good point because Nick, when he came out and uh, started going to cons, absolutely is the model for who people should be going to these cons. I mean, this guy was in his late eighties when he started uh, early eighties rather. And he would go at the beginning and stay till the end and hardly ever take a break. I mean, poor guy. Um, and you know, it's funny because people who talk to Don, there is an interview in there from a fanzine. I just don't think he was ever asked, you know, um, when uh, Richard Howell, who was very important to the book, um, contributed some pencil pages that he and Steve Englehart had worked on with Don, um, which are beautiful. Again, Don's art is beautiful. Um, talked about how um, when, when he wanted to bring Don out for a con, it, Don was just wasn't really interested in it. You know, he did interview him for Comic Scene in early in early uh, publication in the, in the early '80s, but I just don't think Don got asked that much. There's a great interview um, in there when Don was taken to a comic shop, and he was exactly what you were describing Nick being. He loved it. The the people just he just he was really into it because again, all these artists like most today, they're sitting at home and don't don't have the internet, don't have this type of access. I just don't think nobody asked him. And, you know, one thing that really saddens me is someone like a Don Heck and probably a couple other guys, maybe a Russ Manning, a Wally Wood, definitely. Um, if they could have, you know, survived five, ten more years, I think they really would have seen how much the fans love them. Hmm. But but quite frankly, when you're trying to get Steve Ditko, you know, who doesn't do interviews and you're trying to do Jack Kirby, I think Don was just down the list for a lot of people. And I don't think it was. I just think they never thought of him because I don't think he ever turned down an interview. Hmm. And uh, Jim Salakrup, uh, who was his editor, an editor at Marvel and was his editor at Topps Comics, actually brought him out to California for a convention. And I spoke to the convention uh, person there. And the next year, he actually started filming the the panels. Hmm. But it was it was Jack Kirby and Don Heck, and they they're just yucking it up the whole time, according to these guys. And and they're both kicking themselves that they didn't film it. So I I don't think Don was adverse to the fans. Um, you know, Jim Fern, who's in the book, who became one of his best friends, he met Don in a comic shop. And then as Jim puts in the book, I just kept bugging the heck out of the guy who was down the road and he, and he kept letting me come over. So I think he was open to it. I just don't think, I think it was kind of weird at the time hmm. and, uh, not to go on, but I'll tell you, I talked with a lot of the, a lot of the artists I've mentioned, you know, Kurt Schaffenberger earlier, we were talking and Irv Novick, they all found Dan Spiegel. They all found it very strange, the whole convention thing. It's not that they're put off by fans. They just absolutely find it weird that somebody wants to talk to them. And I think that's more of what Don thought, right? Mm -hmm. That, why do you want to talk to me? You know, and as a matter of fact, there, Jim Fern has a great story when Marvel started releasing all of its artwork. And Don was getting these Aveng Avengers pages back. You, you know, you're talking about stuff think, by him, Wally Wood, or Frank Giacoya, John Romita, et cetera. And he was putting that aside and he was going, look at this Wonder Woman stuff. And, and Jim Fern in the interview goes, Forget Wonder Woman. Nobody cares about that. People want this, and he just he just couldn't understand why people didn't want his his latest art because to him he's putting that much more into it. You know, um, just like any artist, they're old. Oh, that's my old stuff. I want my new stuff. Um, but I think to close on that, I think Don would have been phenomenal on the circuit. He seems like he was very gregarious when he was around people. Hmm. I, I just don't think he was ever asked. Fair enough. And by the way, you, you've mentioned uh, Kurt Schaffenberger twice, and I, I got to tell you one of the few pencil drawings that I have from a comic book artist is a Kurt Schaffenberger. <laughs> it's uh it's just a pencil drawing. It's uh it's big though. It's about like yo, what's that eleven by fifteen, something like that. Uh and it's uh my friend Bob Penaha, who later became a, a letterer for a DC and 
uh, some other some uh, indie comics uh, was going to meet him one day. I think I think he lived somewhere in Central Jersey where we were, and he said I, I'm going to meet him. He says, Do you want me to ask him to get a sketch for you? And I thought, hmm. I said, I don't know. I said, Yeah, I, I guess if he would do something, you know, like. Uh, Superman and Captain Marvel together would be kind of cool. So I have that. And I had actually thought about putting that behind me during our interview. And I thought <laughs> people are going to be like, if they knew who he was at all, they're going to be, why does he have a Kurt Schaffenberger sketch behind him during a, a conversation well, about Don Heck? But yeah, it's, you know, a, it's a treasure. Yeah. If I can digress for a second. So I had the, and I don't want to sound like I'm overly familiar with some of these artists, like a Kurt Schaffenberger. I called him up to interview him, frankly, because I'd never read an interview with him. And, uh, you know, became an acquaintance. I won't say any more, but he was very, very sweet person. I, of course, loved his artwork, but his wife, Dorothy, was super sweet, and she was an absolute cheerleader for him. Um, and it's so funny. One of my one of my regrets is I asked him just in an interview, hey, you got any original art? And I was asking to use in the interview. And he goes, well, you know, I got a couple things, and I got this cover from Master Comics. It's uh, Captain Marvel Jr. He's on a horse at a rodeo, and I can't even remember the issue number. <laughs> And he said, it's a hundred bucks. I'm like, oh, I, just can't, you know, I can't really do that now, you know, just out of college. And now, of course, if I see this online, you know, the silver, Golden Age cover by him is $10,000. And I'll, <laughs> I hate it. I hate it that I wanted the artwork, first of all. That's why I hate it. But I also would like to have it for that. But oh, I'm sure. Super nice guy. Super, super nice guy. Oh, there was a whole generation of these guys. that were nice. And I'm sure Heck was a very nice guy. I know Murphy Anderson was nice. Gene Colan was nice. There are people that I've, you know, uh, uh, Gene Colan was on the show uh when we were doing audio i think it was 2008 2009 uh joe sinat was on uh, so yeah i mean yeah i mean the, the great gentleman very you know um all right so let's come back to to, to don and, and and his art you you mentioned the inkers a couple times and uh there's there's some emphasis on that too in the book about how his art ve- seemed to vary in his mind at least based on who the inker was and what i wondered is do you have any thoughts on how Don Heck's art compares based on the inker when you when you juxtapose it to somebody else like uh, Kirby, you know, ink by Sinat or or somebody else? I mean, or you know, is it all just kind of hey, you know, one guy does the pencils, one guy does the inks, and sometimes it's just as random as that? Yeah, I mean, I, I'll speak for myself as a fan and someone who likes Don's work. Um, yeah, I think the best, I think the better inkers for him were people who were better artists in and of themselves. Um, I'll throw out Frank Giacoya, who was kind of a John Romita protege. And of course, Romita is phenomenal. Um, I, I really like Don's work when he inked himself. Um, you know, John Severin, or I think, uh, was it John? Yeah. John Severin, of course, is phenomenal. I think he inked some of, uh, Don's work. I think Sid Shores, you mentioned Captain Marvell, as you said, mm-hmm. uh, Sid Shores. I loved, the Sid Short stuff that, that he inked a heck stuff. And, um, that's why I put, so, put a couple pages of it in the book because there was some original art I'd been able to get photographs of. I thought that was phenomenal. Um, you know, some, I think some of the younger inkers when he, when he had someone who wasn't as stylized or didn't have their own style from the interview, I can take it that Don, of course, wanted to ink his own work. I don't think he minded if an artist, I'll just say of his peer or Ramita, a Giacoya, a Severin, a Senate did his work. Because he, I think he respected them as an artist. It sounds like he didn't like the fact that newer guys were coming in who may have been talented, but he didn't think they were up to his level. Mm. Um, and maybe that's to the point of him not speaking up enough. I, I don't know. Um, he does mention on Wonder Woman, uh, Rick uh, Magyar, I think I'll say that correctly, um, who's been an inker for 10, 15 years, uh, worked at various companies. He really liked his style, and it's funny because his style is is a Ramita esque or a Frank Giacoya that type of thing. Um, but some of my favorite artwork by Don, other than his Wonder Woman stuff, is um, believe it or not, is his Avengers in the '30s when he started inking his own work. Um, I really thought he just went phenomenal with that. I, you can just tell. You mentioned passion. I think he really threw it threw it in. The other person I think that he inked very well was Kirby, and um, I think he did a phenomenal job on Kirby. Um, you know, the, Kirby supposedly is one of the hardest people to ink if you talk to these professionals. And I just think Don had enough of a style that it didn't bury Kirby, which you couldn't. But you took the uh, dynamics of a Kirby layout and a Kirby figure, and you basically just put a little bit of style on it. And uh, I think that was some of my favorite work. Uh, I got to ask you a question. It's kind of unrelated, but it's just a name you mentioned, Frank Giacoya. Mm-hmm. Did he work on Howard the Duck? 
wow, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I'm thinking... Tower of the Duck. Uh, well, you know... Steve Geocoy, Lailoa, I think, worked on that, and then uh, yeah. the Colin. Well, but for some reason, that Ge- name... Yeah, Giacoa worked, if I'm saying it correctly, he worked at D.C., I think, in the 80s, but he was one of the main inkers, and many people have said he's their favorite inker. Hmm. Um, I guess he started in the mid-60s, so probably the early 70s, maybe the mid-70s, so he may have been there when Gerber was doing the Howard the Duck. No, I'm just curious. It didn't really connect to anything other than you know, <laughs> a little misfire of the brain. Um, what surprised you most that you discovered about Don Heck as you were going through this? And, of course, you didn't have him available to you know question about things. So you're reading old interviews. You're, you're talking to people. Um, and I, I should mention to people who are thinking about the book, the, the I don't know, the first half of the book is, is largely composed of uh, uh, art and uh, interviews that um, John found that other people had done, obviously, while Don Heck was alive. And then the second half is more more recent stuff, putting uh, Don Heck in, in uh, uh, kind of in, in, in place in terms of, uh, you know, what people in the industry thought. And, and by the way, my, my opinion of, of his work is not reflected by the people in the industry who are quoted in the book. They love the guy. I, so I'm not trying to... Uh, so, so anyway, oh, yeah. I'm just wondering, did you find things, did you hear things that surprised you? Or did it kind of fit with what you expected? Um, you know, I, I went into it um, being a fanboy, as I always am, and liking his work. And it, it, if I can digress for just a second, it's interesting the later chapters come about because the you always, when you start one of these books, you have a, a mental outline of what you want to do. And, of course, you do a lot of research, et cetera. And the, res, the back chapters came out due to the research. So what, what did I find surprising? I found out um, basically how just uh, – uh, admired this person was. I mean, multiple times, not just the typical, they passed away, now i got to say something nice about him, but in speaking with Mark Avenir, um, and he had some quotes in there from Jack Kirby, I and mean, Jack Kirby just thought this guy was phenomenal. Mm-hmm. John Buscema thought he was phenomenal. I mean, those are two, two of the greats. And, you know, again, he got to ghost for newspaper strips. So I think what surprised me is Don seemed to basically either not know about how much he was liked or as you alluded to earlier, maybe he just didn't care, and he, I want to draw, whatever. I don't know, but that would really surprise me because, you know, I know he was always there. Stan Goldberg, who um, uh, who was able to provide some insight as well, you know, someone who's a legend in the industry, he uh, um, he said some great things about Don, and um, it just it just amazed me how much this person was liked when I was going into it thinking that you know this person was just a recluse. And and he wasn't. He lived near John Buscema. They were really close. He you know, was around Kirby a good bit um, when Kirby lived in, in New York. Um, so I think that was one of the surprises. The, the other thing was is how intricate, integral, rather, he was in uh, the Marvel Age of Comics. So you look at the, the a lot of the early marketing, which is in the book, where, you know, the cartoon, the majority of the Iron Man cartoons are his images. Now, a lot of that had to do with the fact they were using images from the comic, and he drew them. Um, but the majority there, and I kind of match them up. And then the other piece of it was uh, the playing cards, which I had as a kid. You know, all those are scenes with the, you know, funny sayings, out of context sayings and word balloons. Um, various things like that, that, that Don was really a bigger part of the Marvel Age of Comics than I, than I thought when I went in, frankly. Um, that, that's the biggest surprise. And the second thing was, I would say, is uh, just just – his personality, which I think comes through in these interviews. And when you talk to someone like Jim Fern, he was just a, he was a guy's guy. You know, he was someone who would tell it like it is. He was always in a good mood. He was always jovial, according to his friends. Um, lo- again, passionate to draw. Like you said, he may not have been passionate about comics, but he seemed to be very passionate about drawing. Um, you know, had, had multiple friends in the artist community. Um, and it just, he just seemed like a guy who I would have really liked to sit down and have a cup of coffee with, and I bet he would regale you with a bunch of stories, mm-hmm. you know? So uh, one of the other threads, as we kind of wind down here, one of the other threads that kind of recurs in the book is he reaches a point at Marvel and then at DC and then back at Marvel where they don't, he's not getting any more work. And uh, I guess that in my mind that, that might come back, and I could be wrong. I wondered if you have any thoughts on this, but that it comes back to that, that lack of per- perceived passion that he wasn't that involved with. Okay. I mean, in the Marvel universe, everything interlocked. So I would think that if, if you were the artist and you weren't that interested in knowing that, uh, Spider-Man was, was, uh, you know, this month was, uh, a guest in the Avengers or, or that, uh, 
Iceman from the X-Men was, you know, crossing over with uh, uh, the Human Torch in Fantastic Four, um, that was not going to win over an editor who was deciding who was getting work. That The editor wanted to see... I'm just I'm making this up. I don't know if I'm right or not, but the the editor wanted to see that enthusiasm and interest in the characters, in the plot line, in the interactions, and that maybe they kind of reached a point where there were so many people coming out uh, or coming up who had that interest that they went with people who wanted to be in the in the industry and participate in that kind of thing. We well, you know it, it's funny because again I'm I'm just having read what you've read. I'm having the same uh, type of. Uh, stream of consciousness here you know i i actually think that at any time especially in comics it seems like every 10 or 15 years you know ageism comes into play and styles come and go mm-hmm. um i mentioned earlier you know the image style was really hot in the 90s and so that's what people had her primpies written about that how you know he had trouble i tried to draw like that it just wouldn't work and now of course he's back um i think it was more that i think it was more a younger guys coming in they want people their own age I really don't think it had to do with you keeping up with the storylines. Um, I only say that from a, an assumption because as I've spoken and read multiple interviews from all these guys, you know, unless you're a creator like Kirby, um, I don't know that you keep up with the, the line of comics. You know, I, I just don't know if that's a point of it. I think it's more along the lines of your style is out of style um, or they may you know, be intimidated by you being older and established. Or frankly, they just want to hire somebody else. Um, cheaper. Now, yeah, cheaper. well, that too. But I mean, to your point, you know, in any in any profession, you know, I think you obviously have to deliver the goods, which Don did. But I think you also have to step up and and you know almost you know make your own way because if you don't, there's going to be someone who is, and just by clanging of the gong, that person's going to get noticed, and you're not right. Um, I spoke with Al Milgram, who's in the book as well. Um, Al was um, important to bring him back to Marvel in the 90s. Um, there's some work in there from from him. Um, but he had said along the same lines that he goes, I just think it just fell out of style. I mean, that happens today to to, to, to people who, you know, were big in the 90s. If you're still drawing that way, they're not going to want you now, you know. So I think it's just a lot of that. All right. Well, Roy Thomas, you would have the answer to this question. So if you watch this yeah, and you want, you want to speak up, we both I think we'd both be interested in hearing what you have to say about this particular issue. All yeah. right. John Coates, last question. Oh, goodness. Maybe it is. Maybe it's not. Who knows? We'll see. We'll see. Here. Yeah. He's, he's hoping it's the last question. Let me get the hell out of here. No, um, no, no. no. <laughs> um, three Don Heck uh, works that you would recommend to somebody who may not know his work or you want them to see his work the way you see it. Yeah, it, it's easy. Um, his Avengers work in the, uh, in the thirties, I think it starts at about maybe issue 30 through 38 when he's inking his own work, I think is just absolutely beautiful. Um, I think his work when he was doing the flash with Carrie Bates was writing it in the late seventies. He had a two or three year stint on that book. And I'm going to pronounce this incorrectly, but the Inca was Charlamenti. You know what I'm talking about, Frank? Uh, oh, just... Ch- Cheramonti. Cheramonti, thank you very yeah. much. Yeah, hooked on See, Fonica. folks, I've read comic books. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, Cheramonti, I've never known how that. So I think he was phenomenal. And then, of course, I know people are going to laugh. His Wonder Woman work, when he was inking it, those last 10 issues, um, unfortunately, the last issue had the flexographic press, which anybody who was around at that time, you've lived through that horror. Colors were not with the lines, et cetera. But those three works, the Avengers in the 30s and uh, the Shiamonti artwork, if I'm saying that correctly, for The Flash, and then, of course, his later stuff with Wonder Woman. I mean, that's three eras of people's work. I'm not just telling you to go look at the stuff in the 60s. I'm saying this guy could really knock it out of the park even when he was late in his life. So those are my three. Excellent. Excellent. Well, uh, I have to say I appreciate that. Uh, despite you, the, obviously you knew from the start that I was not a big Don Heck fan. You stayed yeah. with it. You uh, stated your case uh, rather elegantly, I think. And uh, you know, if people are interested, I think you know they should they should check out the book. And which leads me to, folks, you can order John Coates' book, uh, the new biography, Don Heck: A Work of Art, uh, in great bookstores everywhere. Or uh, as always, you can order it right now right here online at Mr. Media. If you are watching this show on MrMedia.com, I think you know how this works. Somewhere below John, maybe over here, maybe over there, uh, is the cover to his book. Uh, you can click on it. It's, it's somewhere over there. Uh, you can click on it right now. It'll take you to Amazon. Um, 
and uh, they'll, they can get it to you via drone in 30 minutes or less, or if maybe that's not available in your area, like it is in mine, uh, they'll, they'll send it to you within a day or two. Is it, is it uh, available as an ebook? It, well, if you get it from Tomorrow's on their Tomorrow's site, I think when you buy the book, you get the PDF free. It's not an ebook, but it's in a PDF format. Okay. All right. So yeah. you can do that. But folks, buy it Buy it on MrMedia.com. Buy, buy the hardcover. We'll all profit from it. Um, can I give you one last thing? Of course. Um, so I wanted to also mention that the uh, portion of profits of this book are going to Heroes or Heroes.org. And I don't know if many of you who are watching are familiar with that, but it was an organization that was started about 10, 15 years ago, and it was initially called Actor, and that didn't make a lot of sense, but mm -hmm. effectively what it is, it's an organization that basically helps um, comic creators who have fallen down on their luck, whether they're, um, it started out with a lot of golden age artists and, and people like that who just didn't have any royalties and things like that with their work and needed health insurance or who are down on their luck and needed some help. So it's a, it's a phenomenal uh, charity, and it goes to help those in the comic industry who basically created the industry we love so much. So please, uh, if you don't buy the book, keep that in mind and go to their website and make sure that you uh, donate. That's very nice. And is there, uh, do you know the website? It is heroes.org, and I'm going to suspiciously reach back here and pull a book. And uh, Oh, my God, what, what a coincidence. You have copies of your book behind what you. Coincidence. What a coincidence. <laughs> Look at that. Um, all right, hold on. Um, and I don't have my reading glasses, but go to heroes.org, and uh, you'll be able to find it. Very good. And can people find you on 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 the interwebs? Are you on Facebook or Twitter or any of that kind of stuff? I'm not. I'm on. I'm on a Twitter. I'm a, I'm a lurker. Um, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm not on Facebook because I know myself. I would absolutely be addicted. My wife is. But if you want to contact me, can I get my email address if, out? Is that it's it's your it's your email address. Go. Yeah, it's a initials J D Coates C O A T E S six three at gmail dot com. All right. Folks, give that out. No. Uh, <laughs> well, I'll tell you if, you, if you buy the book or whether you don't or not, I'd love to hear from you. Um, I just love talking comics and I love talking about Don's work. That'd be great. All right. Well, uh, John Coates, uh, pleasure having you here. Great conversation. Uh, you did a wonderful job of, of defending your, your uh, subject and uh, talking about the book. That's the thing. I didn't have to defend. <laughs> no, no. And it's a really, it's a, it, it's a really interesting book, like I said, because – it, it, I mean, to me, it's like warts and all. It's like you're actually getting – I felt like I got a complete picture of the guy, even though there's limited interviews available. I got a, I felt like I got a well-rounded picture on the guy. And, you know, uh, you know, when it comes to art, everyone's got, uh, everyone's got an opinion. It's a, we don't all agree on everybody. Well, I, I'm hoping we all would agree on like Steranko, but maybe <laughs> beyond that, I don't know. Uh, but, John, thank you very much for joining us, Mr. Media, today, and good luck with the book. Thank you so much. Shadow in the corner's getting restless.